Hey, Mike, we're back in the studio at Rami Films for Haven's podcast, Measure Twice, Cut Once. Hey, Jennifer Lee, always great to be back here. What a great place and some amazing people to talk to today. I'm very excited to get into it because as we keep working our way through these award-winning designers and builders, there's so much ground to cover and so many amazing stories. And what has become apparently clear as we move through this season is nothing is by accident. All these people have won awards for very good reason. And it's really exciting to dig into the stories behind the people and behind the thought processes that culminated in these people winning Haven Awards and Georgie Awards and all sorts of other awards and recognition that is well-deserved. Yeah, it's not just about, like you said, winning the award. There's a lot of steps that take uh, place to get them. And it's like people don't realize that sometimes a lot of the times it's like people don't enter for 20 15 years into their career. So it's just a really cool thing. Yeah, well, you see certain people who seem to consistently win, and congratulations, they've, there's a reason for that. But then you see people who don't win every year, or any year even. And it's really, really incredibly special to see people who are first-time award entries and winners, and especially seeing them up in the winner's circle as well, because it's just phenomenal seeing people get the recognition they deserve in this industry. And I think it's a great opportunity for us to sort of shift gears a little and stop talking about awards and start talking to some award winners. You want to get started? Yeah, I want to welcome. I love this guy every time he comes into our studio, but Kang from Architrix Design Studio and then new timer, which I just got to meet today, which is lovely, Paul Lilly from Kingdom Builders. Good. Welcome, guys. Yeah, welcome, thanks guys. very much for having us. Yeah. So, uh, Paul, since you're new to Measure Twice, Cut Once, we're going to put you in the hot seat first, if that's okay. I don't really know a whole heck of a lot about you, and I'd like to change that. I'm wondering if you could share a little about yourself and your background for our viewers and our listeners so we could learn a little bit more about what makes you tick and a little bit more about Kingdom Builders. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, my background is uh, in mechanical engineering from UBC. And uh, from there, uh, I went into uh, the wood products industry. I, I started out with Warehouser Company for the first 10 years of my career. And that was in uh, mostly uh, uh, softwood lumber manufacturing. And then um, <clears throat> I was in uh, last assignment with uh, Warehouser was in North Carolina and uh, really wanted to be closer to family. I grew up here in Vancouver. And so um, in 2005, uh, we started Kingdom Builders and it was uh, my brother-in-law who'd been in uh, the construction industry for 20 years. Um, and then myself, new to the construction industry, but uh, familiar with project management and industrial um, manufacturing. Uh, and uh, since that time uh, with Kingdom Builders, uh, we focus largely on renovations and custom homes uh, and then uh, continue to grow the company uh, over the years. Uh, we always had uh, an interest in sustainable building, but uh, it was uh, a little bit later in the history of Kingdom Builders that um, uh, I joined forces with a, a project manager that we still work with, um, uh, Aaron, who is uh, LEED certified and really brought in uh, a lot of the uh, uh, green building knowledge. Um, and uh, our first uh, passive home that we built, we had the opportunity in 2016 to, to build a passive house in Vancouver. Uh, and it was a, a great success. We you know, had great uh, metrics, uh, very airtight home, uh, a really good success, uh, a, a phenomenal client. And that was really a launching pad for us to, to where we are today of building uh, high performance homes uh, um, in almost uh, uh, the majority of our projects are that way. Great. And Kang, we know you quite well here and you're part of the Haven family. And of course, you've been on Measure Twice Cut once before. But for the listeners, can you give us a little Kang refresher? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first off, thanks for having me here again. It's always fun to come and hang out with you guys and, and ch chit chat and share our knowledge with uh, all the listeners and uh, the world out there. Um, so a little history about myself. I uh, I studied biology actually in university. I actually so, didn't know that about you. <laughs> yeah. So the whole um, you know intent of my education was to go into medicine, and uh, I I was always interested in art and architecture, and I think I really brought like the biology um, kind of training and understanding into my work just through like understanding the natural processes of nature and understanding a little bit more about efficiencies and how to simplify processes to make our projects more e efficient. Um, so that's, you know, a little bit about my background in, in terms of my work 
background. I uh, a after I graduated from BCIT, I worked with a company called Formworks. They are uh, a very high end custom residential architectural firm, and from there, I just um, springboarded into my own kind of creative output and was able to get some projects, and then it grew to many projects until you know now where we're quite busy and you know we get to work with some great builders like Paul and we get to win awards and it's 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 been it's been a great journey so far. Perfect. And how did you guys find each other? What was your oh, origin yeah. story of how you first met? Yeah. I, I first met Paul at um, the Passive House project that you had finished in 2016. Yeah, that was your first project, and I, I you you did a big tour. And you, that was uh, the passive house uh, days, right? Yeah, where the that's house right. was open to the public, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's where I first learned of uh, Kingdom Builders, and that's where I first met Paul and his team at that uh, at that project um, that they had just finished, and that was 2016. Yeah. So that's right. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question for both of you. Both of you, it feels like we're very early adopters of this energy efficient methodology in building houses that is only now sort of becoming commonplace. <clears throat> In both of your cases, what drove you to want to build or design that particular type of home? Because I think it's important for us to understand the motivation for you to be early out the gate with something that's going to be commonplace in a few years, but absolutely isn't now. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And it's really, uh, it's bottom line, it's just the right thing to do. Um, you know, it, interesting with Kang, what he shared today of his, you know, interest in biology and, and myself uh, and our family, we spend a lot of time in nature. You know, we live close to Mount Seymour, the trails, the network there. Uh, a lot of holidays we go on, it's, it's to do outdoor activities, that sort of thing. And so, uh, you know, that's a, a really uh, um, part of life we really enjoy and appreciate. So it, it's just the right thing to do. And uh, and also, um, we just have a, a thirst and the culture in the company is just to continually learn and challenge ourselves. And so it, instead of just doing the same old thing all the time, there's different ways of building that's not only higher quality, better ways to do it, but it's also better for the environment. So a fairly natural uh, fit for us. Yeah, I would agree. It, it it does feel like the right thing to do in terms of the efforts that we all put in into our daily routine is to try to do better for the world. And at any opportunity we can, we try to improve our knowledge and our technique to make our footprint smaller, um, really just to ensure that. And I have a you know, seven-year-old daughter that I think about all the time, and it's just thinking about the future and what, we're, what we'll leave for them, and, and really for us, too, while we're here, to, to do good things and to you know, preserve as much of the environment as we can. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and your daughter is so cute. I've met her before. Uh, yeah, that's right. She came to <laughs> yeah. a party. She came to the Havan Gala. She came Gala. to the Haven Award party, which, of yeah. course, we're going to talk about a little um, later about yeah. the awards you won. But, uh, yeah, she might be running your company one day, so it's important yeah. to uh, create a legacy. And when you have certain clients that want to build these homes and come to you as either a builder or as the architect, do you find that there's a lot of teaching them about the home or do they kind of know a lot about these types of home like passive home and they're passionate about it or do you find that it's kind of like a great learning process of like why you're doing it and, and why you guys are passionate to kind of be the leaders in this field absolutely that the it's interesting the amount of information and education that's available out there to homeowners and our clients it's it's there's a lot of information and there's a lot of interest um out there for someone building a new house. I think everyone's on the same page these days about, you know, doing better and being more conscious of, of how we're building. And and so I would say that a lot of our clients know at a high level. Some clients like Carl, who is the client for this project we're talking about today, he knew quite a bit. He and I took the passive house course together and that's how he and I got connected. But, you know, to the level that he knows about passive house, not every client knows. Um, to that detail and to that extent, but a lot of clients do know about it. There is a lot of education. The majority of our clients will need to get educated if we are to go through the passive house route. Um, but yeah, there's definitely education that needs to happen for everybody as we're going through these types of projects. 
Yeah, I, I kind of feel uh, definitely agree with you, and and I kind of feel uh, in the beginning, uh, especially like I say in 2016, the first project we did, uh, there wasn't a, a big pull uh, for the energy efficient building. So the clients we dealt with in the early days, it was uh, less clients uh, uh, than we have today. Uh, but they were actually quite uh, informed because it, they were driving it. You know, it was, it was something they wanted to do, they knew about and they wanted to do it. Uh, whereas um, uh, I think that a big shift in the industry is is the uh, the cities, uh, the provincial government, municipalities yeah. that yeah. have given relaxations or, or mandated Mandates. certain levels of performance. Uh, and that's made it uh, not negotiable. Uh, and there's a whole lot more information out there now. And so, um, uh, you know, early on where it was starting to become a bit more mainstream, but it wasn't fully required. We almost made a bit of a menu for people that, okay, you don't have to go, you know, this, this to a certain level, but here's some things you might want to consider, like uh, an easy one that people can appreciate and understand is upgrading your windows. You know, it's quieter, it's the weakest uh, uh, thermal part of your uh, building envelope. Uh, so that's money well spent to upgrade your your windows. And so, you know, you kind of start that way, but I'm finding now um, with the... the uh, uh, promotion and, and requirements of, of the uh, government, uh, it's made a huge difference. Do you find any resistance though? Because I know that there are some mandatory things that you have to hit, especially with the step code and depending on what municipality in, do you find any resistance from the clients or everyone kind of wants to do more? actually well get more steps yeah that's a great question and i think the the thirst is yeah more but uh especially in this climate uh is the cost of it right yeah uh, is absolutely. that uh you know the, i'm not saying that you know doing the right thing or building it energy efficiency is way more expensive but you know to go the full you know do everything you know to the highest level for sure you know there's there's additional costs and so it's trying to to balance that out and and you know if you're fortunate enough to have a, a client um, that uh, has the resources uh, uh, and then you can just really focus on, you know, maximizing or doing the best you can, you know, that's a great environment. But the reality is most of our clients, that's not the case. Uh, and so you're trying to help them uh, get as much as they can, but, you know, at a, a budget that works for them. I think the more of these projects and the more award-winning projects like this happen, the more it becomes mainstream. And it's going to be really interesting if someone picks up this podcast 10 years from now, you know, if they're listening to this going, making a big deal about a passive house where that's how they get made, right? <laughs> yeah. And hopefully that's where we get to, but we're, we're definitely not there yet. On this particular passive house, so I'm kind of curious. So both of you are 10 plus, uh, 10 plus years Haven members in your respective crafts. And had you worked together before this? I'm not sure. But how did you come together on this particular project? Because you both come from such unique backgrounds. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll share how we met. Uh, so Carl and I took the passive house course. Um, it was, I don't know, 2015, 2016, just at around the same time that Paul was finishing his passive house project. And, and it was, it's interesting, interesting that you mentioned that back in the day, quote unquote, which wasn't very long ago, there, there wasn't a lot of awareness right? and there wasn't a lot of, uh, policy that that forced homeowners to reach any certain level of energy efficiency. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the folks who were interested in building and learning about it had to take these courses and, and it wasn't as readily available, you know, online or through media, but I met Carl at this passive house course and he and I got along really well. He's quite, quite the fella. He was great to, to, to get to know. And he is his passion for technology and his passion for learning was, is really inspiring. So, um, after we took that course, his son, Eric, was building a house. And so Carl, who was really funding the build, um, pushed his son, Eric, to build Passive House after taking this course and after being convinced this is the way to build and this is the future of building. And, and, and so the first project that we did was Carl's son's house. And so... When we finished the course and when Paul had finished his passive house, our team toured Paul's passive house. And that's when I first learned of Paul. And I, I believe Eric or um, Carl might have toured the house as well. But we were all introduced basically one once we had met Paul and uh, toured his first passive house. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that's what I remember as well. And then uh, uh, there's uh, Karen Shaw, um, Arbutus mm -hmm. uh, Interior Design. That's uh, uh, a longtime friend of Carl's. Uh, uh, has done interior design projects uh, with Carl in the past. I'm thinking of the, uh, the house that they were living in before they moved into this, and then also in Whistler, she was involved. Um, uh, she also, I remember uh, getting a phone call from her, you know, uh, saying that they've got this project, which was Carl's son's home. Uh, we'd like to talk to you to to see where it goes, and that's kind of where it kicked off as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the first project that we did together was not this project. It was a previous project, and it's interesting how it's all related. Mm -hmm. You know, Carl's son, passive house, and it all uh, you know spawned from there. That's right. Yeah, and we didn't screw up the first one. So we yeah, got the exactly. opportunity to do yeah. the second one. So yeah, <laughs> and we should have submitted for that one. Back, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when it was yeah. it, there was no category for energy, energy efficiency, efficiency but time. it would have. I think it would have won all the awards for any category would have we would have submitted for. Yeah. Right. It was a beautiful yeah. home. It was very nice. Yeah. Well, I'd love to talk about this home, but before we do that, we have to take just a couple moments to have a quick conversation to thank our podcast partners. So we'll be right back, okay? Measure Twice Cut Once is grateful to our podcast partners, Fortis BC, Vigo Stone Canada Inc., and Trail Appliances. Support from our partners help us share expert knowledge and resources with families looking to build, design, and renovate the home right for you. Vico Stone is renowned for providing exquisite quartz slabs, ideal for both kitchen countertops and vanities. Their extensive range caters to diverse preferences, offering everything from the versatile builder collection to the opulent and luxurious designs. Established as a reliable and preferred choice in the industry, they have earned the trust and admiration of local stone fabricators and interior designers. Trail Appliances makes everyday life better with the best selection in Western Canada. Hassle-free delivery and a price match guarantee, so you'll always get the best deal. Trail Appliances, make sure you'll love buying an appliance as much as you love using it. And we all need reliable and efficient equipment for better comfort, health, and safety for our homes. Whether you want to adopt some energy-saving habits or take on major energy efficiency upgrade, no matter what your budget, Fortis BC can help you save energy. Be sure to visit fortisbc.com rebates, where you can also find amazing tips on low and no-cost ways to save energy, plus buying advice for energy-efficient products. So before we left for a break, we had talked about how you two got connected on this home. Now this this is really the fun part. Now that we know who you guys are, we know what makes you tick, and we know how you came together, we get to talk about a cool project called the Queen Mary, which mm -hmm. won some awards. It's getting some great press. Um, Kang, why don't you start by telling us a little about the inspiration for the home, and we can sort of work our way through the process from there. All right. Yeah, the inspiration I feel really was driven, or the the you know, the design kind of direction was really driven by Carl. Mm. He was um, very keen on firstly building a passive home, and then secondly building a, a unique home, a, a home that really was different than you know everything else that was in the neighborhood, which was Fort Langley. Um, so yeah, this house w was uh, built in Fort Langley and a really, and I don't know if, you know, some of you have been out to Fort Langley, but for those who you haven't, it's, there's a lot of history. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of kind of old timey um, vibe mm -hmm. out there. And there are quite a lot of really nice homes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of money being spent out there for uh, custom homes. And, 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 and there are a couple of really nice brick buildings, like the, the municipal buildings. There's a couple of really nice brick ones. And I think there was inspiration from Carl using to use brick and then really to, to, to do a home that was unique. And, and so the whole idea of doing like a Frank Lloyd Wright prairie style brick home was, was kind of the driving inspiration behind the project. Um, and it was really driven by Carl, and I just helped facilitate mm -hmm. that vision. And then, um, you know, Paul stepped in to execute it from a construction perspective. Mm -hmm. So for people who are listening aren't familiar with Fort Langley, it's one of the oldest settlements in British Columbia, so it definitely has that historic heritage feel to it. Yeah. And to our people watching and listening to this, you have to check out the photos because you guys have done a really, really great job of bringing in that timeless design. And it actually fits in the neighborhood really, really nicely, which is not something we can say about all new homes in classic neighborhoods. So good work. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's gorgeous and that's why it's the haven winner for best custom home three million and over and best energy labeled home uh, for custom so congratulations guys i always feel like i need to like pop a champagne or something when i say <laughs> that <laughs> it's just like there Absolutely. you pop it for us and then um i also know that it's a passive plus house so what is the plus because we talk about passive homes all the time but we never talk about the plus that much hmm. Yeah, so the the Passive House Plus uh, is a uh, uh, added recognition for uh, generating uh, power on site, and in this project, uh, the exposure was uh, good for solar panels. So uh, we have uh, solar panels on the roof that uh, uh, generates uh, the majority of the electricity the the um, home consumes in a year. When it comes to solar, I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there. It does rain here a lot there's a lot of overcast so does that mean the people who own this house can only use their solar panels four or five months a year uh, no even if uh it doesn't have to be uh, um, a clear sky uh just the the light um uh through the day is enough you know to generate uh, power so uh year round uh, it'll generate electricity mm -hmm. uh, and with uh the solar system it's actually an interesting thing because it's become a lot more approachable um, in the uh, past, um, we were having to have battery banks and that sort of thing. So I was like, where are you going to store them? What's the additional cost of having the, uh, the batteries? In this case, uh, there wasn't a need to have uh, uh, power stored. Um, and in a lot of uh, cases, that's how we're doing the solar systems now. And so it's a grid tied system. So it's net metering. So uh, if you're not using the power, if you're away or you're at work and not consuming energy, you can sell it back to the grid. And so on really high performing days, you know, a great sunny uh, day, obviously there is more uh, electricity being generated with the bright sun uh, on the panels is uh, you're able to bank that by selling it back to the grid. And it fits the design so well too. Like when we're looking at the photos, it's not like sometimes you look at homes of solar panels mm -hmm. and they're not <laughs> placed really nicely. It just looks like, oh, we just stuck some solar panels on it and didn't think about the design element. So can you talk a little bit about maybe how you incorporate things like solar panels into your design so it, it doesn't look like an eyesore king, it looks like part of the house? Yeah, that's a great question because in this particular case, the solar panels weren't the driving factor in the design. And and so, you know, we designed the roof line to fit the the holistic architecture of the home. And it just turned out that some of the roofs were actually oriented really nicely to capture or capitalize on the solar gain. And from the photos, I'm not sure if, if you or your listeners will notice but there are quite a lot of trees. Mm -hmm. And and so the house was placed in this nice little clearing and we did have to remove some trees, but the house was placed in this perfect little clearing where again, it was, it, it was very fitting and suitable to have solar panels placed on that particular roof to capture, you know, the most amount of sun that that roof could capture. So that's right. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of if you are to design for solar panels right from the get go, there's definitely more thought. Um, into the roof form and the slope and the overall architecture of the home. Uh, and, and, you know, if you're lucky, like what, you know, we experienced, if the solar panels were then conceived of after as long as, as you go along, yeah. hopefully there's, you know, it's the, that the, you know, the stars line up <laughs> <laughs> to allow for optimization of the solar panels. Yeah. Technically, to have an energy efficient house, you don't have to have solar, but we tend to think of energy efficient homes as somewhat boxy and, and a very conventional design. This is definitely not a boxy design at all. It's very open and airy. Does having the solar panels allow you to do more things with the house to offset would otherwise be some of the parameters you have to deal with with a, with a net zero passive house? Like, can you make it more open and spacious because you do have solar panels up there as, as opposed to having to go with a box for energy efficiency? Uh, I'll, I'll quickly answer. Yeah, that, sure. Right. Yeah. The, the, the way the passive house, um, kind of parameters work is not so much to do with the solar production of a home. It's more to do with the energy consumption of the home. And, and so the solar panels, aren't really part of the baseline passive certification. Um, and that's why it's passive plus. Mm -hmm. They they introduce passive houses introduce these levels of passive 
uh, certification or levels mm -hmm. uh, depending on solar production or, or energy production. So the baseline is Passive House and then you have plus, there's gold, silver and platinum and then plus? I think it's plus and then premium. Plus and premium. Yeah. And those signify levels of power production that you can achieve using solar panels. Yeah, I believe uh, premium is if uh, you generate all the power you consume in a year and mm -hmm. plus is is that you're generating some power but not 100% of the power that you consume. Mm -hmm. I thought they would go pass a plus plus plus, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that might be too hard. Yeah. Uh, what is the gold then? Because we've never heard about that. I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe it I, is. I think it's uh, passive house plus, plus and, then and premium. premium. Oh, okay. Right, we'll make yeah. our own. Maybe gold will be like the future. It'll be like the ultimate. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, like yeah. you've got your own farm in the background or something. <laughs> no, no, that's a titanium. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a titanium it, it, the motivation with it is uh, a, a common stat is uh, uh, the carbon. We we're talking a lot more about uh, carbon uh, uh, embodiment and and carbon production and. Um, uh, within uh, BC, 60% of uh, the carbon emissions comes from uh, buildings. And, and so, um, you know, we can reduce the carbon uh, footprint by the, using the materials and stuff that we use, how efficient the uh, equipment is, uh, building, you know, passive house and that sort of thing to reduce the energy that's needed. Uh, but the, the solar getting back to that is um, a clean uh, way of generating electricity that's not uh, relying on, on carbon or fossil fuels. Uh, and so that's the the uh, main driver behind it is is uh, a clean energy source. And as Carl likes to say, he's he's full of uh, great expressions. And and one is uh, with the sun, it doesn't send an invoice. So why wouldn't you use it? You know? <laughs> yeah, very true. <laughs> hey, speaking of uh, energy, you have some unique heating and cooling options in this house that are not typically found in a passive or net zero house. You guys want to go into that in a little bit of detail as well? Because I think it's... Uh, the melding of old versus new and how you guys figured it out is beyond me, but I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. Carl's, Carl's, uh, um, a really interesting, uh, fellow, uh, and quite a, a, a great background. And, and he's always, uh, as Kang alluded to earlier, just his thirst for knowledge. And, you know, he's always, uh, challenging uh, people or, or he gets to know your strengths and what you're interested in. And he wants to push, push you to kind of learn and, and grow with him. And uh, he had an experience with a, a project he d has done in the past where he had a really cold basement, you know, and, and it just didn't kind of work out well uh, for him. Um, and so he was really concerned about having a warm basement. And so uh, the passive house we've we've done in the past, uh, as most people know, you can pretty much the equivalent of a hair dryer is enough to heat the home. And so when Carl's talking about a cold basement, it's like, well, no, it'll be fine. Because uh, we really, you know, uh, wrap the, the basement and the foundation in like 12 inches of insulation under the slab, really thick foundation walls with lots of insulation. And so it'll be fine. But, you know, it's like, okay, well, if Carl wants a, a warm basement that's, you know, very comfortable, um, what op options are there? And he was challenging putting radiant floor heat uh, in the home. And uh, the first thing is like, oh my goodness, you know, you're going to overheat the yeah. home. And that's, that's not a passive thing. Like I just want to talk about it for a second. It's no, like, usually yeah. they're like, no, 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 radiate <laughs> heat when it comes to passive homes, right? Yeah. And most of our clients uh, really in the past uh, building in this area, uh, it's more that the heat wave, the uh, warmer periods of the summer is where there's more of a concern is, is, is cooling after, you know, uh, 10 days of plus 30 degree weather, you know, it starts to get uh, a little too warm. So how do you deal with that? Uh, but so it was a, a bit of a different perspective. And, and so uh, we did, you know, kind of scratch our head and say, well, who's done this? You know, what can you do about it? And um, sure enough, there's a, a builder in Washington State, uh, south of Vancouver here that uh, was is doing a lot of passive homes and using radiant floor heat. So we decided to head down there and meet up with him. He was uh, gracious enough, like a lot of people in our industry that mm. want to share and that sort of thing. And so we just went down to check it out. And and uh, the thing that kind of tipped us off is, is, you know, reducing the amount of heat you're going to have in the home uh, was our biggest concern. It's fine to add it, but, but don't overdo it. And instead of putting the, the water heating pipes to the, the regular standard that we do uh, with a, a code built home is we spread the pipes out yeah. a lot wider than, than typical. So you're getting that radiant floor heat, but you know, much less of a, um, uh, 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 
uh, BTUs, you know, like the amount of heat that you're putting in is a lot less. And so, yeah, so we were able to come up with the design, learning from them, uh, and we uh, successfully implemented it. So, yeah, it was good. That's so cool that like you guys are always working together as a community in the passive ups, no matter like even if it's across the border, just to go back to a little bit, because some people don't understand, like you were saying, just to make it for the listener, usually in a standard radiant heat, the pipes are closer together and then yeah. you guys spread them out. Yeah. So it's less piping. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 And, and so uh, normally we're putting them about six inches apart. These ones were about 12 inches apart. Um, and uh, we did have uh, installed a bunch of temperature temperature sensors, you know, throughout the floor, you know, and, and just seeing, you know, uh, how often the heat comes on and, and you know, and trying to fine tune the temperature so we're not uh, shocking the system, putting too much heat in because you've got a huge thermal mass of the slab and if you overheat it, then you know, you'd be uh, take a, a while to get the heat out of the house because the whole principle of the home is to retain, you know, the heat. Uh, so uh, you have to be very careful how you do it. Uh, and the neat thing with it as well, uh, back to uh, the car carbon we talked about, is that we actually used an electric boiler in this case, as opposed oh. to most times people think of radiant heat, you're using a gas fire boiler, but uh, this was a an electric one. So many cool features, mm -hmm. like we can learn out about this all day long, but I question from going from Carl's son's house to Carl's house, what were some things that maybe you guys learned or even Carl learned from doing the son's house and then to his own house? Hmm. And like, did you improve anything? Like, wish... Does he have a better house than his son now? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, wish yeah. Carl was here to answer that question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a few things that we did different, but uh, I guess maybe if I turn the question around a little bit, just the introduction to Carl and kind of what he brought to the table is that, uh, uh, yeah, he's, a, he's a, and I think maybe uh, there's a lot of learnings that we had by even doing his son's house uh, that we carried through. And uh, Carl's a um, yeah, like an incredible person. Uh, if you meet him, very hospitable and, and very much about uh, learning and teaching you things. And so um, we'd never built a, um, a prefabricated home before, and he's had the experience of doing that. Um, and so the first one was his son's. Um, and so in order to help us understand about it, he wanted to bring us uh, up to Whistler and uh, see the house that he built up there as a prefabricated home and then tour the BC Passive House uh, plant up there. And so, um, um, yeah, it was a great experience. Uh, I even brought uh, the Kingdom uh, team along and even my daughter as well, because I just thought, well, what a That's cool fun. experience to pass yeah. it on the knowledge. And uh, it was just a wonderful day. They hosted us up there. Uh, Carl's wife, Karen, made us a, a lovely breakfast and we, you know, toured around. Uh, and it's incredible, you know, what we, what we could learn. Uh, and with the prefabrication, it was also um you know why and try to you know wrap our heads around that and carl uh, being in the car business he said well how about if you bought a car for me and i showed up at your driveway dumped some parts on your driveway and then assembled your car you know that's how we're building houses building it on site um uh, when you can do it so much smarter by by doing uh, prefabricated so our first exposure to that was carl's son um, and then uh, there were some changes that we did from from that design to Carl's house is um, just uh, some of the uh, panels and stuff that we've manufactured. Uh, we did it differently with Carl's um, uh, to be able to achieve the um, uh, architecture of the home, you know, so we kind of progressed along that way. But, you know, a big, big learning for us through the whole process was just getting introduced to the uh, prefabrication and the benefits of that. Hey, I have a technical question. When you're building a passive house, it's really, really important that the building envelope is maintained. You can't have any penetrations. We can't put speakers on exterior walls because cold spots and things like that. As we're looking through the pictures, there's this amazing, amazing floating staircase. How the heck did you guys do that? Because you couldn't attach it to the building in a conventional sense, right? This is the fun of talking about these really technologically proficient people uh, creating these really amazing spaces is they're pushing the envelope. And I want to know how the heck you guys figured out how to make this staircase float the way it did. Because if you haven't seen the pictures yet, they're absolutely stunning. And it's like very, very unique. And I want to know exactly right down to the letter how you did it. Uh, well, just from a design perspective, the stairs were placed on an interior wall. They were placed not on the envelope. 
And like you mentioned, if it was placed on the envelope or on, on an exterior wall, it would have been much more difficult. So, you know, when, when designing or thinking about high performance homes and design, you know, you think about how to make that envelope as easy to build and as simple as possible. And in this case for the stair, we just pushed it towards an interior wall. And so, you know, the structure and the supports of it were, were, were not an issue from a thermal perspective. Yeah. And then from a construction and structural and, you know, um, support perspective, that's, it, it was quite an interesting um, yeah. Execution from Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kang. And and it's um, so so exactly as Kang is saying, the uh, exterior wall, you know, is is full of insulation, and so you don't want to have the thermal bridges there, and because obviously we have uh, you know plugs and you know different services and stuff that do end up in the uh, exterior walls. Uh, with uh, this style of construction, we do a service wall, so a three and a half inch wall on the inside so that you're not interrupting the insulation uh, in the thermal wall um, and you can run your services. And so the stairs actually, uh, part of it uh, does, um, uh, it, it's not in the exterior wall, but it's alongside the exterior wall. Uh, and then just to back up a bit, we had um, uh, CLT panels uh, that we used in the design of the house to create an elevator shaft. Um, and we had some leftover CLT panels, cross laminated timber. And so um, in hanging that uh, staircase off the exterior wall, the challenge was how are we going to make this strong enough uh, in a three and a half inch cavity um, to uh, support the, the stairs uh, uh, stringer. And so uh, working with the uh, uh, project engineer, we were able to come up with a way of attaching um, this CLT panel in the service cavity. And that gave us the strength that we needed to uh, mount the staircase, which yeah, again, I was really excited about because it's a traditional or not a traditional, it's a passive house, but uh, uh, we were able to give, you know, all the cool features that you might think are not always possible. So, yeah. And you, you I mean, anyone who's listening to this, I haven't done a very good job describing it. Go to haven.ca, check out the pictures. It's truly, truly inspiring. And I can see why it's the winner uh, of three Georgies this year. Haven's winner for best custom home with three million and over and best energy labeled home. Uh, just want to ask you guys a question for winning these awards. What does it really mean to you as the architect, as the builder to win a Haven Award? Yeah, I would say it means it means a lot. The recognition is, is a, you know, I feel you feel honored. I feel honored to be recognized for the work um, and to be part of this team, this winning team. And yeah, I, I know it, it makes me proud of the work and it makes me want to do more of the same work and to drive myself to learn and, and to keep on pushing towards, you know, doing better. And I bet your daughter was excited to pick up the award with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's it was great to bring her. It's it's you know she had a good time there at the was award. Was this your first award? That you like, you've won awards before, correct? Yes. Okay, but have you won awards before? Yeah, uh, we had entered into uh, Haven the year before uh, with an interior designer, and uh, she won the uh, best interior design, and we had the associate award. Uh, but this was the first uh, award that uh, that we've won um, uh, in, in Haven. Well, congratulations. congratulations. Yeah, thank That's you. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really is a big deal to win an award like that because it is so rare and it's just such a, a huge honor. Gentlemen, we want to take a couple seconds because I'd be remiss if we didn't to say such, just a huge thank you to both of you for taking time out of your day today to share your story, to share your background and to share some inspirations, some philosophies, and some of the things that drives the both of you to create these amazing projects that you partner on as well. It gives homeowners a chance to get to know who's behind the projects, the type of people who are creating these things and bringing them to life, and it really adds life to the awards process. There are people behind these awards mm -hmm. and there's processes that lead to it. And there's so many things that we could talk about that we learned today and, you know, so many great lessons. But the two that stuck out to me, first of all, had to do with your floating staircase. And the lesson is that teamwork, right? It was a group effort to make this work. There was an idea, something 
to be created and you worked together to find a solution and you integrated the design. And the second had to do with when we were talking about the radiant flooring, that was really, really neat because both of you had to go and do some additional learning in order to make it work. And really the lesson learned there is no matter how good you are at your craft, even if you're at the top of your craft, there's always a continued learning and the best people in this industry never stop learning. So great conversation and really, really, um, tons of inspiration for us as well. And we do this all the time. Mm. Thank and you. And I Thank know you. that you guys have given us so many great tips today, but please just one more each, one more tip for the audience, one closing thought from each of you. You can't cheat, you can't combine. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's it's. Uh, uh, I, I guess we, you know it's it's uh, very humbled to to have this opportunity to be on the uh, podcast and and to win the awards. But uh, you know, it's so much bigger than we are. There's so many people that are involved uh, in putting put, pulling together a home like this, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the education or the collaboration, and uh, um, you know just. Having having a, a a team with consistent values, you know, as you've mentioned, of of a thirst for knowledge, of wanting to do uh, uh, better, um, and and keep pushing the envelope. Uh, I think that's that's the environment that you need uh, to be successful. Um, because if I sat here and said it was me and I did this, you know, uh, I'd be a fool. Because you know, it's it's uh, really a, an amazing team behind it that it's uh, got us to where we are, and and that's critical. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would say teamwork makes the dream work, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that definitely is something I believe in as well. Is finding that team, um, whether it's you know just the builder or the the whole you know sub trades team behind the builder and the interior designer and also the client. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all working together to to put forth these projects um, and to just do what do what you love and to promote and to to you know be part of the 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 drive of whatever that you're passionate about or whatever you're doing it's just to you know always aim to do better i love it an important last question for you guys where did you put your haven awards <laughs> <laughs> ours is so paul uh let us take one of his awards. oh take one okay <laughs> <laughs> So one of them is sitting um, on our uh, right in our middle uh, shared office uh, meeting room desk right now. Yeah, yeah. And I, we've got one that floats around the office and uh, is sitting on my desk right now. But uh, I've ordered more uh, oh. for the team to be able to share them around as well. So, so you have to do a timeshare with uh, Kevin on the awards. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I want the award for October. You're getting it for November. Yeah. Yeah. For December. yeah. Just sign up on the uh, online, the 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 schedule list. <laughs> hey, speaking of signing up online. What a great segue to the next part of our conversation. Mm -hmm. As you know, we have these amazing partners for our podcast and our friends at Fortis have an awesome prize for our listeners to win. You're probably sitting at home watching this going, this has been great and all, but what about my barbecuing needs? And it just <laughs> happens to be that if you've listened to this episode, you've liked this episode, you've told your family, you've told your friends, you can have a chance to win a Napoleon Prestige P500 stainless steel natural gas barbecue valued at $1,500. As mentioned from our podcast partner at Fortis BC, all you got to do is go to haven.ca slash measure twice, cut once, and you too could be grilling in the backyard of your beautifully designed passive home or wherever it is that you live. And Mike will uh, come make a brisket for you on it. <laughs> Just throw that in. <laughs> Extra prize there. And uh, for notes and links to everything mentioned today's episode, including resources from these lovely gentlemen beside me, uh, Paul and King, go to haven.ca slash measure twice, cut once. Thank you so much, Trail Appliances, Fortis BC, Vico Stone Canada, and Ramey Films. And thank you for joining us for another episode of Haven's Measure Twice, Cut Once. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you. That was awesome. Thank you. Good.